Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Grace Minister Sunday School Bible. My name is Green Faulkner, the Sunday School teacher. Appreciate you looking in this morning. Hope you got your Bibles, your study notes, extra paper and pen, because we always give extra scriptures, or extra notes you can write down, have to study. We appreciate you looking in. Just be much in prayer for the lesson this morning. We're still going to be studying God's Word. So let's go to the throne of grace and ask God to bless our time of study. Father God, we do thank you, Lord, for the privilege of the study of your word. We thank you for the word that you have given us that we can learn more about you and about our walk with you and about the need of salvation than our service to you and our rewards and our rule and reign in time to come. And Lord, just help us to understand this and just bless this time of study, Lord. Bless everyone that's looking in this morning. God, just bless them beyond measure from the study of the word to realize, God, it's a joy to study your word, to be taught, to learn that we can have a prosperous, victorious life in the Lord Jesus Christ. We do not have to live in fear with the way things are going on, knowing you're in control, and you're going to do what's right, and you'll give us grace to endure and persevere right to the bitter end, enable us to contend for the faith and live a victorious life and live a happy life, Lord, in these troublesome times. So, Lord, bless this time of study this morning, and we will thank you and praise you. Lord, for us in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you for looking in this morning. If you got your study notes, we're going to continue our study on about the judgment seat. As we know, it says in, the, in God's Word in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27, And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. So a lot of people think when you die, some, some cults and religions teach that after you die, you just rot away, you're not, you just go into annihilation, you just disappear, there's no body, no soul, and that's, that's the end of it. But we know that the Bible does not teach that. We know that God breathed into man's nostrils the breath of life, and he became a living soul, which will never die. This body's going to die, but the body also is going to be resurrected, and a new glorified body is going to last throughout eternity. If you're saved, and if you're lost, you're going to have a body that's not going to be glorified, but it's going to be a body that you, when you go off into the lake of fire in everlasting fire and torment and punishment, you're going to feel the pain, the separation from God. So we know that there is afterlife because it says, as it is appointed unto man once to die, but after this. So after this means there is something after death. And you need to realize you're going to, if you live long enough, you're going to die unless the Lord uh, comes back before you die, then you'll be raptured out in the church if you're saved and born again. If not, you'll be left behind to go through all the suffering and trials and troubles that's coming on this earth. So you need to realize that after you die, there is something else. There is an eternity starting after you die. But the first thing you're going to face after you die is the judgment seat. For believers, you're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. We looked at that last week. And then if you're lost, you're going to stand before the great white throne judgment. And both judgments is going to be for your works, not for your sins. Your sins will be judged here on this earth while you're living. And when you die and move move on, your sins are left behind. The consequences and the judgments for sin has been completed. But then you will be judged for your works. And that's going to, well, why do you need to be judged for works? Because as Christians, we're going to be ruling and reigning with Christ for a thousand years. And then after the millennial kingdom, after God comes back and passes the final judgment on Satan and the unsaved during the tribulation period, he's going to create a new heaven and a new earth, and then eternity is going to begin, and we're still going to rule and reign with Christ throughout eternity. So, as we said last week, what will you be doing? What kind of rule and reign will you be, have? What will you be doing? That will be determined by your works while you are here on earth. After you're saved, God calls us to work. And we will be judged for not the quantity of our works, but for the quality of our works. So let's review real quick. Back on your study notes on page uh, 14, on number three, believers will be judged. We're talking about the judgment for the believers. And when we finish this, whether it be this week or next week, we, then we will talk about the judgment for the person that's lost and undone. You're going to be judged for your works. And that's going to determine the degree of punishment that you're going to suffer in the lake of fire throughout eternity. That's going to be determined, the degree of punishment you will receive. But for the believer, we saw last week in Romans chapter 14, verses 10, 11, and 12, we're going to give an account. You're going to stand before the judgment seat and give an account of your service. And we, we will be at the judgment seat of Christ. That was in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10. 
and the works going to be judged by fire, the word that comes out of God's mouth. That's in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 11 to 15. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 17. And, and we know, say, when you stand before the judgment seat, God knows your heart. It says in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12 that we're going to be judged by the word because God knows the thoughts and intents of your heart. He knows what's in your heart, why you're doing what you're doing, and so forth. So he knows your heart. And then you, the works will be judged for quality and not quantity. And we're going to see that in a parable we're going to look at this morning. So if you've got your Bible, go to the book of Matthew, chapter 25, and we're going to start reading in verse 14 through 30. Now, this is a parable. Jesus was talking to his disciples, and he was teaching them in parables. Now, we know a parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. So God is, Jesus Christ is using this for an example for us to compare the earthly message that he's given to a spiritual message that we can learn about what he's trying to tell us in the spiritual realm of life. So let's start reading which Matthew chapter 25, verses 14 through 30. And folks, I want you to pay close attention to this parable. It's talking about three servants under the Lord. He goes away and he brings and gives them gifts to talents and use while he's gone. And when he comes back, they're going to give an account. And then he's going to judge what they've done. And then he's going to reward them. And then, then so forth on down the line. So let's look at verse 14. For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country, who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. And unto one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one. And look at this. To every man according to his several ability, and straightway took his journey. Verse 16. Then he that had received the five talents went and traded with the same and made them other five talents. Likewise, he that had received two, he also gained other two. Verse 18. But he that had received one, one went and digged in the earth and hid his Lord's money. Verse 19. After a long time, the Lord of these servants cometh and reckoned with them. Verse 20. And so he that had received five talents came and brought other five talents, saying, Lord, thou deliverest unto me five talents. Behold, I have gained beside them five talents more. Verse 21. His Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Verse 22. He also that had received two talents came and said, Lord, thou deliverest unto me two talents. Behold, I have gained two other talents beside them. Verse 23. His Lord said unto him, Well done, good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Now look at verse 24. Then he which had received thee one talent came and said, Lord, I knew thee that thou art an hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown, and gathering where thou hast not straw. And I was afraid, and went and hid that talent in the earth. Lo, thou, thou hast, that is thine. Verse 26. His Lord answered and said unto him, Thou wicked and slothful servant, Thou knewest that I reap where I sow not, and gather where I have not strawed. Verse 27, Thou oughtest therefore to have put my money to the exchanges, and that at my coming I should have received mine own with usury. Now verse 28, Take therefore the talent from him, and give it unto him which hath ten talents. Verse 29, but unto every one that hath shall be given, and he shall have abundance. But from him that hath not shall be taken away, even that which he hath. Now look in verse 30. And cast ye this unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Man, that's a powerful story. And we're going to look at it. Like I said, it's an earthly story with a heavenly uh, meaning behind it. Now, this comes down to our study. We're going to talk about our study. You know, we talk about the method of study, how we're to study. 
keep scripture in context and we always say you always have five questions like when you're looking so when you read this parable here's, here's what I want you to consider uh, question number one who is speaking question number two uh, let's, I'm, let's see and uh, say who who is he speaking to question number three what are the circumstances question number four what is our responsibility? And question number five, what will be the results? So here, you, you in studying scripture, you got to realize, you got to find out, first of all, who is talking, who is speaking. The second thing you need to know, who is he talking to? Third thing you need to know, what are the circumstances? What's going on at that time? What are the circumstances? And then the next thing you need to do, need to know, what is the responsibility of the ones that he's talking to? And then the last thing you need to understand is what are the results? What what are the results of what how they handled their responsibility and how they responded to it? So this is a good way to learn how to study your Bible. Ask yourself those five questions, and you will get, you'll be amazed at the answers you get. Now I broke this down, so you take your Bible, and I want you to look. I want you to look. I want you to look at this. How I broke it down. Now let's look at verse. Verse 14. Let's read verse 14 again. For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country. All right, let's stop right there now. It says the, the person traveling is the Lord Jesus Christ. Now we're going to find that out in just a minute. Into a far country who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. So let's look at this again in verse 14. The man traveling is the Lord Jesus Christ. Number two says the far country is heaven. Jesus Christ ascended into heaven after his resurrection. And number three, the servants represent, in the first instant, the uh, 12 disciples to whom Jesus addressed in, in the parable. And then, in a broader sense, all, all born-again believers. And number four, the talents represent the spiritual gifts given each of us. Okay, to th talk about this now. It says... A man traveling into a far country. This man is the Lord Jesus Christ. He's going back to heaven. He's, re he's died on the cross. He's been buried and he's resurrected. And he's going back to heaven. But he calls his disciples. And, and he gives us gifts to news. That's the talents that he gave them. He called his servants, which is the born again believers. He called them to himself, the ones that followed him. And he gave them gifts. That's the talents. He gave them gifts to news while he's gone. And he is coming back. And the talents represent the spiritual gifts. And, and one thing, too, we're going to notice. In the last part of verse 14, let's see, let me see. No, in verse 15, let's see. Yeah, let's go to verse, let's read verse 15 and continue. Verse 15, after he gave them the gifts, and unto one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one. To every man, according to his several ability, and straightway took his journey. Now, what is this saying here? One, he gave five talents. One, he gave two talents. One, he gave one. You know, we've talked about before about the spiritual gifts that God gives us through the revelation of the Holy Spirit to us. And we saw that in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, where we studied about the spiritual gifts. God gives different ones, different gifts. He gives us our gifts according to our abilities. God will not call you to do something that you're not equipped to do. If he does, he will equip you to do it. But he's not going to give you more than you can handle. He's not going to ask somebody maybe don't have much education that you're going to be a big preacher, a big teacher, because you really wouldn't have the, the ability to really learn and study in depth in theology and so forth. I have a limit as far as I can go. I have a high school education so I'm limited on some of my studies. So God's not going to call me above what I'm able to do. That's where he stops. So God's going to give you the gifts that you that he wants you to have, the ones that you can handle, and he's not going to give you any more than you can handle because he knows your ability. He knows your talent. He knows your gift. And so he's not expecting any more out of you than what you're able to do. So, all right, now let's, let's look at verse... Uh, Let's read verses 16, 17, and 18, and then we'll comment on that. Then he that had received the five talents went and traded with the same and made them other five talents. Verse 17, and likewise he that had received two, he also gained other two. And look at verse 18, but he that had received one 
went and digged in the earth and hid his Lord's money. All right, now let's look. Let's see what the Bible's saying about that. If you break it down and you study it, let's see what it's saying right here. Okay, now it describes what each servant did with his talent, which is his gifts, and indicates the faithful use the Lord's people should make of spiritual gifts and opportunities for service. So here you have the uh, servants or the believers getting, getting the amount of gifts that God wants them to have. He gives them the ability to use it. Now, the opportunity, what did they do with it? Did they use it wisely? Have they used it in the opportunities that they had to use it? So God gives us a gift. He gives us a talent after we're saved, and he expects us to put it to use, take advantage of the opportunities that you have as a teacher, as a preacher, or or somebody goes out on visitation, somebody has useful gifts, somebody has other gifts, administration, office in the church, then he expects us to be faithful with it and use it to our uh, best ability that he has given us, and then then we will give an account. Now let's, let's break it down. Look, let's look at verse 19. Then look at verse 19. After a long time, the Lord of those servants cometh and reckoned with them. Now, as we say, the Lord Jesus Christ has ascended back to heaven. He has given all the believers that follow him that have really been born again. He's given us a gift. He's given us a title. And we've seen well now he expects us to put it to full use, take every opportunity, advantage of it, and, br and bring forth more fruit. The guy that had five talents went and worked and brought back five more talents. The one had two. He went and worked, took took. Uh, advantage of his opportunities and gained two more talents. But the one that received the one talent didn't do anything. He just took and dug a hole in the earth and hid it. He did not use it. So let's let's see what happens on that deal. All right. Okay, and then the last part of that verse, look at the last part of verse 19 again. And reckoned with them. Remember we read in Romans chapter uh, 12, verses 10 through 14, that we're going to give an account. See, that word reckon in other translations is used. We're going to give an account. So you know when the Lord Jesus Christ comes by, he's gone right now. He's given you an ability. He's given you an talent. And he's expecting you to put it to use to gain more talents, to gain more rewards. And he wants you to put it to use and use it. And when he comes back, he's going to call you before the judgment seat. And you're going to give an account. He's going to reckon with you. In other words, when you stand before him, He's going to want to know what you did with the talent that he gave you or the gift that he gave you. Did you increase that gift? Did you, were you a soul winner? Were you a blessing to people? Did you help people? Did you do it for the right reason? And if you did, he's going to reward you, as we saw. All right, now let's look in, verse, uh, let's look in verses 20 through 29. All right, now this is where it gets kind of tight, folks, so pay attention. Verse 20 through 29. And so he had received five talents, came and bought other five talents, saying, Lord, thou deliverest unto me five talents. Behold, I have gained beside them five talents more. His Lord said unto him, now look at this. Now he, he was faithful with his gifts. He doubled his gifts. He had great rewards. Look what the Lord said unto him in verse 21. His Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. So when he came before the judgment seat, he was found faithful. He used his gift. He used his talents. He increased God's kingdom through the use of his talents and gifts. And God was well pleased with him. So he commended him, saying, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. He said, You've been faithful over a few things. I'm going to make you ruler over many things. So see, it shows again after the Lord comes back, you're going to be judged. You're going to be commended. You're going to be rewarded or lose your rewards. And for what? He's going to make you ruler over many things. You're going to rule and reign after he comes back here. You're going to be judged, give an account, receive your rewards, to determine the position that you're going to have when you rule and reign with Christ in the millennial kingdom and in and e eternity. Now, the guy that had five talents got five more. So the Lord said, well done. He said, you've been faithful over a few things. I'll make you rule over many things. All right, so now let's look at verse uh, 20, 22. He, al he also that had received two talents came and said, Lord, thou livest unto me two talents. Behold, I have gained two other talents beside them. His Lord said unto him, Well done, good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. 
I will make thee rule over many things. We heard that somewhere a while ago, didn't we? Into thou, into the joy of thy Lord. Now here you have another servant that didn't have but two talents. But he used his gift and his talents to his full ability. So it, see, it goes to show you it's not the amount of your gifts or your talents. It's how faithful you are with what God gives you. Because he said the very same words to, to the man that had five talents and gained five more. And the man that had two gained two more. He said the exact same thing to both servants. One had five. One had two. But they, each one was faithful with what he had. And God said to both of them, Well done, thy good and faithful servant. Thou has been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. See, there's no distinction between the one that had five talents or five gifts and then the one that had two. See, it's not the quantity, folks. It's not because this man had five or because this other man didn't have but two. They both had gifts that God had given them according to their ability. They were faithful in using those gifts, and they brought forth fruit. And God said to each one of them, Well done, thy good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over what I've given you, and now enter into the joy of of thy Lord. So folks, it goes to show you no matter who you are, what you are, as long as you are faithful with what God entrusts you with, whether he gives you five talents, whether he gives you two, or even if he gives you just one, one talent. See, it's not the amount. It's the faithfulness of in the quality of your work. If you do it because you love the Lord and, and want to do it and give it the best you've got, God is going to say to if that one guy that had one tile, if he had been faithful and bought forth another tile of making two, he would have said the very same thing to the guy that had one tile. Well done, thy good and faithful servant. But see, he was not faithful. He was not trustworthy. And now we're going to see the results on that. Okay, let's see where we at right here now. Okay, yeah, let's continue reading. Okay, all right, let's go to verse 24. Then he which had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew thee that thou art a hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown, and gathering where thou hast not strawed. And I was afraid, and went, and hid thy talent in the earth. Lo, thou, thou hast thine that is thine. Okay, see, so this servant that had received the one talent, he didn't do anything with it. He was afraid, maybe if he knew it, he would lose it. Or either he just nonchalant or care less and just sat back on the stool or do nothing. So he just dug a hole in the earth and hid it. And like a lot of people said, well, I'm on the way to heaven. I could care less about the gifts. I could care less about working in the church. Let somebody else do it. I don't want to get involved. I'm just going to sit back and ride in on the coattail and go in just shouting glory. But folks, it's not going to work that way. So let's see what happened to the man that didn't use his gift or didn't use his talent. Let's look in verse 26. Now let's see what the Lord said to him. Remember he said to the other two, Well done, good and faithful servant. Let's see what he said to this man. Verse 26. The Lord answered and said unto him, Thou wicked and slothful servant, thou knewest that I reap where I sow not, and gather where I have not strawed. Verse 27. Thou oughtest therefore to have put my money to the exchanges, and that at my coming I should have received mine own interest. So what the Lord, in the other translation, makes it easy, easier reading right here. He said, well, if you didn't want to use the money that I give you, at least you should have put it in the bank, and then the money would be dr drawing interest, and when I come back, I could have got my money back and also had interest. You know, people have savings accounts, they put money in the bank, and it draws interest on it. That's what the Lord was telling this man. Look, if you're not going to use it, at least you could have put it in the bank, and it could be drawing interest, but you didn't even do that. You were so wicked and slothful, you didn't even do that. You just dug a hole in the ground and hid it. Now, let's look in verse 28. Take therefore the talent from him, and give it unto him which hath ten talents. See, he lost his talents, and he had no rewards because he was given to somebody else. Now, look in verse 29 again. For unto every one that hath shall be given, and he shall have abundance. But from him that hath not shall be taken away, even that which he hath. So he lost. He lost it. He lost his gift. He lost his talent. He lost his money. And let's see what else he lost. Now look in verse 30, folks. This is powerful right here. 
And cast ye the unprofitable servant into out of darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now let's look at our study notes on verses 20 through 29. Judgment for service given account. Number two, believers, we're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. The unbelievers, we're going to stand before the great white throne judgment. And the second thing, it says the faithful servant will receive his reward. He'll be commended by his Lord and enter into the joy of the Lord. We saw that in, the look, in fact number three. The unfaithful servant will lose his reward, be scorned by his Lord, and his joy will be none existent. So he's going to be scorned. The Lord didn't say, well done, faithful servant. He called him a wicked, slothful servant. And that slothful means lazy, good for nothing, do nothing, say nothing, or whatever else. Now let's comment on verse 30. Then here's the comment on verse 30. Now listen, let's read verse 30 again. And cast ye the unprofitable servant into out of darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now you listen very closely to what we're going to say here now. Many theologians say the unprofitable servant in verse 30 and the wicked and slothful servant in verse 26 represent a person that has never been born again. This could represent a person that has never been born again. Do you realize, folks, like we said before, there are many people serving God today. There are many people in churches, even preachers, teachers, missionaries, evangelists, uh, all kinds of workers in the service of the Lord that have never been saved. And when they stand before the Lord Jesus Christ, they just, they're not going to hear well done. They're going to say, he's going to say, depart from me. I never knew you. And I'm going to give you three examples out of God's word that there are people in churches today that think they're saved, think they're born again, but they have never repented of their sins. They have never confessed to their sinners and asked God to come into their heart to save them and write their name in the Lamb's Book of Life. And they're working, working, they're preaching, they're teaching, they're singing in the choir. They're doing this, they're doing that. Let's look, I'm going to give you some biblical examples. The first example I want to give you, there were many unbelievers in Jesus' day that served in the name of God, Jesus, religion, and Christianity that were never saved, they were born again. The first example, go to the book, turn back in Matthew to, to chapter 7. Go back to Matthew chapter 7. We're going to read about the, some workers, Christian people, preachers, teachers, as you want to call them. They were the religious crowd, the scribes and the Pharisees in Jesus' day. Now let's see when he come around, let's see what was said right here. Let's see. Now look in verse 21. It says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Now look in verse 22, folks, of Matthew 7. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? See, there's a lot of people going to stand. They're going to end up not before the judgment seat of Christ, for believers, but they're going to end up before the great white throne judgment for unbelievers, and they're going to look at the Lord and say, Lord, didn't I preach in your name? Didn't I teach in your name? I was singing in the choir in your name. I was professed to be saved. I thought I was saved. I was doing all this in your name, in the name of Christianity. I was doing this, and I was doing that. See, they were laying out all what they were doing, and they, they were working hard. It says, casting out devils in their name, done many wonderful works. But look in verse 23. This is going to be some sad words to hear, folks. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Man, can you imagine somebody just lived their life and thought they were saved? They've been in church. They've been serving God. They may even been preaching. They may be a great Sunday school teacher. They may sing in the choir. They may lead the evangelistic program. Yes, folks, this can happen. People can do this. See, God doesn't honor the person, but he honors his word. A, a man that's not saved can preach the word, and God can honor the word. He does not honor the man. He honors the word. God says, my word will not go out void. Sometimes even no matter who's giving it out, even if a lost man is witnessing 
thinking he's saved and he's doing good, God can still honor the word. It's not the man, but the word. See, it's not us he's honoring. He's honoring what we're doing in the Lord's name. So here you have a religious leaders to think they're saved, but they're not saved. So you need folks, if you're you need to know that you're saved. We teach, you know, we've taught about eternal security. You can know that you're saved, but if you got doubts about it, please make sure today just ask God to search your heart and see whether you're really born again or not, if you're really saved. Because the Lord knows you don't want to hear God say one day and you've worked your fingers to the bone all your life in churches doing the best you could do, and then you're going to end up hearing God say before the great white throne judgment that apart from me, I never knew you. I hope you'll never hear that. I hope you'll live to the day you'll hear God say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Example number two, Judas Iscariot. He was a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. All right, let's go to the book of, uh, let's go to the book of Luke, chapter 6 and verse 13. We got several on to read. Let's go to the book of Luke, chapter 6 and verse 13. I think that's the one I want to read. We're going to find out here in just a minute. 6, 13. Okay, to show you that, see, even one of Jesus' disciples, see, he chose 12 disciples. He handpicked them. So he picked one named Judas Iscariot. Let's see who this guy was. See, he walked with Jesus for about three or three and a half years. He was the treasury of the group. He sat under Jesus' teaching and preaching. He saw the miracles. He participated. When he sent his disciples out, he sent Judas out also to work for him, Judas was one of Jesus' own hand-picked chosen disciples. But he was never saved, folks. Does that blow your mind or not? Why did Jesus pick him knowing that he was not saved and would never be saved? So you said, well, that don't make sense. We'll see why he did it. Look in Luke chapter 6 and verse 13. And when it was day, he called unto him his twelve, his disciples, and of them he chose twelve whom also he named apostles. And then you got the names right on down the list. We're not going to take time to read the next few verses, but it names everyone, every one of his 12 disciples. They go to the Gospel of John, chapter 6. Let's see who this Judas was. Let's go to John, chapter 6. And I got here verse uh, 71, but I'm going to back up to verse 66. Look in John, chapter 6. six. Let's start reading with verse 66. And look at this, folks. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. Now you see another reference that in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 19. See, anybody that's following Jesus was called a disciple in that day. And there were many people following him, they were called disciples. But Jesus even told them, hey, you're following me for the fishes and the bread. In other words, what you can get out of it, you're taking advantage. You're using me for your own benefit, he said. And then after a while, they just got tired of it, and they, 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 they went back. See, they, wouldn't, they were not true disciples. They went back and walked with him no more. Now look at verse 6 to 7. Then said Jesus unto the twelve. Now he turned, and the Judas is right in, this, right in there with them. He says to them, will you also go away? Verse 68. Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. See, Judas has heard the words of eternal life. He has seen it in action. He walked with the Messiah, the one that could save his unworthy soul. And he was familiar with this. Now look in verse 69. And we believe on and assure that thou art Christ, the Son of the living God. See, that's what you've got to confess. You've got to know that he is the Christ, and he's the Son of the living God, and he's the Messiah. But look in verse 70. Jesus answered them, have I not chosen you twelve? See, Jesus chose these twelve, and Judas Iscariot was one of them. Now look at that. Let's read that verse again and look at the last part. Jesus answered them, Have not I chosen you twelve? And look at this. And one of you is a devil. Why in the world did Jesus choose a devil? See, that's why you have to study. I got to study on Judas Iscariot, and we're going to do it one day. And you're going to see why Jesus chose Judas what reason, what pur he had a purpose. He has a purpose for everything. It was not just a nonchalant accident. Now look in verse 71. Now who is he talking about? One of you is a devil. He spake of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for he it was that should betray him, being 
one of the twelve. One of the twelve that walked with Jesus, heard him preach, teach, do marvelous signs and wonders and miracles. And he was right in that. But he was never saved, folks. Just because you go to church and just because Judas walked with Jesus for three years or more, just because Judas was involved in the ministry, uh, he was involved, folks. He was doing it. Now, folks in church today that are involved, that are Judas, they have never been saved. And they never, some of them probably never will be saved. All right, let's look at it a little bit closer. Stay in John, go to chapter 13. Now here, that this was at the Last Supper, and Jesus was going to wash their feet, and, you know, and Thomas ran up and said, Jesus, you're not going to wash my feet, yada, 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 all down the line. I mean, Peter. Let's look at it. Let's read that. Starting at verse 8 of uh, John chapter 13. Peter saith unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet, Jesus answered, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. Simon Peter saith unto him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said unto him, He that is washed needeth not save to wash his feet, but is clean every uh, whit, and ye are clean, but not all. See, Jesus was washing their feet. It was a significance that, you know, we've studied this. We may look at it again, but there were four words, you know, I told you you need to understand about that was washed, washed, and part, and clean. Look at those four words and study them to see what this scripture is talking about. He's talking about when you're washed, you've been washed in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. One time and one time only, you are clean from head to foot. You have you are white as snow. Your sins have been washed away, and you are born again. So you do not need to have to repeat that again. See, he told Peter, you don't need to wash your body all over again. Peter said, don't only wash my hands and feet, but wash my whole body. Jesus said, well, your whole body don't need to be washed because that's already clean. Only your hands and your feet because we get our hands and feet dirty with the toils of this world as we're serving him. Walking in this world, we get contaminated sometimes with this world, with the sins of the world. So those sins have to be washed away and that's just confession and repent of your sins and then Jesus will cleanse your hands and your feet. That's what he was talking about. But he was sitting here, he said, all of you are clean, but not all, not all of you. Now let's look at verse, uh, yeah, verse 10 again. It said, Jesus said, said to him, he that is washed need not save to wash his feet, but is clean every whit, and ye are clean, but not all. Now look at verse 11. For he knew who should betray him, therefore said he, ye are not all clean. Now, who, he, who was he talking about? The 12 disciples was at this last supper. He was washing their feet. And then Peter said, you're not going to wash my hands and my feet. Jesus said, well, if I don't, you don't have any part with me. In other words, you're not going to have fellowship with me. And if you've been saved and you don't need to be saved again, you just need to clean the defilement of the world off of your hands and your feet in your service. But he said, and he washed them. He said, all of you are clean. He said, but not all. One of you is clean because he knew who was going to betray him. Because you remember, he told Judas, what you're going to do, go out and do quickly. See, Jesus knew that Judas was never saved. He was an ever true disciple. He was never a true follower, but he, he was right in there with the other 11. He experienced the blessings. He experienced the uh, whatever the minister had. He participated in it. But folks, Jesus knew that he was never saved. Why? Because he chose him. Because he knew he would betray him. And he was a devil. But Jesus chose him for a purpose and for a reason. And when we ever go back and study this, we'll look into the depth on that. See, so Jesus knew. So, see, you have somebody that walked with Jesus himself for three and a half years, was never saved, never born again. Now, let's look at the present time, the church members. Go to the first John, over in the back of the Bible, to first John chapter two. First, we looked at these scriptures before, but we're going to look at them again. First John chapter two. First John chapter 2, this the whole book is talking about people that are born again, what they need to do and how they need to live their life, and et cetera. And Jesus is talking about, you know, if you're saved, yada, 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 all the way down the line. It's going to repeat a lot of what we said. But I want you to go to verse 19 of chapter 2 in First John. Now here he's talking about church members, folks. He's talking about people that belong to the church. Look in verse 19. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, 
they would no doubt have continued with us, but they were not, but they went out that they might be made manifest. They were not all of us. So what is he saying, folks? Look at his clothes, folks. This is talking about professing believers, talking about a church. It was two men in particular that was in that church. They were workers in the church. They were serving in the church. But in time to come, you know, we read back in John where some of the people said they went back and followed Jesus no more. See, eventually long enough, if unbelievers, more than likely it'll be made manifest, it'll be made, in other words, it'll be made known. It's going to come to be known that they were really not saved, really not born again. They left the church. John is saying here, if they had been really been born again and been saved, and they were in the church and faithful, obedient servants, then they would have continued with the church. They would have stayed in the church, continued to serve the Lord. But in time to come, they apostatized. They went out and they said they went out for one reason, that it might be made manifest. They were not really of us. So, folks, there are people in churches today that are not really true believers. They have not really been born again. They look like they've been born again. They may even smell like it, look like it, act like it from the outside external. But salvation is internal. The heart has to be changed. You've got to receive the Lord Jesus Christ in your heart, not in your mind. It's got to go to the heart. And then you'll change from the inside out. You don't change the outside. So many people say, well, i got to quit this and i got to do this. See, they're trying to change the outside, the external thing. But the Word of God changes the inside. He works from the inside out, not from the outside in. It's not anything we can do to change the outside. To get to the inside, you've got to be changed from the inside outside. So it's got to be an internal experience. And until these people experience an internal change of the heart, by believing that the Lord Jesus Christ is the Messiah, that he died for our sins, that he paid the penalty for our sins, and by believing that and trusting him and confessing with our mouth and receive him into our hearts, then we'll be saved. But folks, please listen to what I'm saying this morning. I want you to search your heart this morning. You may be a church member. You may be, you may be a preacher. You may be a Sunday school teacher. You may sing in the choir. You may go on visitation. You may stand at the door and give out tracts and shake people's hands. You may help in the administrative part, bookkeeper, treasurer, secretary, whatever you do. That's all kinds of uh, gifts. You know, we looked at every one of them. And they're given to different people. You may be involved with it. Judas was involved. He was serving the Lord Jesus Christ, but he was never saved. And he went out and ended up going to his own place. We're going to see that later on as we study that at some point in time. But folks, you need to realize... Search your heart. The Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter, chapter 13 and verse 5, we need to examine yourselves whether you be in the faith. Are you really saved and really born again this morning? Are you utilizing the gifts that God has given you to your best ability, being faithful and obedient, taking every advantage of every opportunity you have to serve the Lord, and then at the end of time, because you will stand before the judgment seat of Christ if you are saved, and you will give an account of your service, and my, I don't know what your desire is, but my heart's desire is to hear the Lord Jesus Christ when he examines me and settles my account with him on my service to him. I want to hear him say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I'm going to make you rule over many things. Into thou, into the joy of thy Lord. And folks, I hope that's what you want to hear, that you are faithful, you are obedient, you're serving him to your best of your ability. And if you are, no matter what your gift is or how many you've got, five, two, one, it does not matter. We looked at it. The number does not matter. It's what you do with the gift that you have. He rewards you. The guy with the two uh, talents, he received the same reward that the guy had five talents. So see, it's not quantity, it's quality. Why did you do it? Did you do it from the heart and give it your best? And if you did, you were going to receive a reward and you will rule and reign with Christ and you have earned your positions. You can't earn your salvation, but you have got to earn your position in the in the rule and reign of Christ in the millennial kingdom and then throughout eternity because that will be determined by how faithful you were with the gift that God gave you, how beaten you were, 
and taking advantage of the opportunities and being a soul winner and being a blessing to people in this world, letting your shine, let your light shine bright on the hill. And at the same time, we're going to see in maybe next week, the judgment seat of the unbelievers, what they're going to face. They have different degrees of punishment in hell, just like it's different degrees of rewards and position in heaven and in eternity, folks. They have different degrees of punishment. Some people are going to suffer more than others because of the opportunity they had to hear the gospel, or some may have never heard it, and they, they're not going to suffer as bad as somebody has heard it. Can you can you imagine how much suffering that Jesus Judas Iscariot is going to suffer? He was chosen by the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Walk with Jesus for three years. Enjoyed the blessings of walking with the Lord. Saw, heard his preaching and his teaching and saw him perform miracles and, and great signs and wonders and just everything to the hill. But one thing he lacked. He never received the Lord Jesus Christ into his heart to be saved and born again. So when he stands before the judgment seat of the great white throne judgment, can you imagine what he's going to have to answer for. Just like a lot of people today, folks, you've heard the gospel preach. You may even been to church, been under conviction, but you've never done anything about it. You had every opportunity in the world. God revealed to you that you were lost, but you put it off or you didn't, I don't need that religious stuff or I'll do it another time or I don't believe in this stuff or yada, yada, yada. See, if you had all these opportunities, when you stand before the judgment seat of the great white throne judgment as an unbeliever, your punishment is going to be more severe than somebody that's never heard the gospel, but still they, they're not saved because they never heard the gospel, never had the opportunity. They are not going to suffer as bad as you will. So folks, please keep it in mind this morning. Search your heart. Am I really, truly born again? And if I am, God has revealed to me, given me a gift, and he expects me to be faithful and use it for his glory because that is going to determine what I will be doing in the millennial kingdom, ruling and reigning with Christ. And then when eternity begins, I will continue to rule and reign. And what will I be doing? Folks, this is serious. Please search your hearts this morning. Let's pray. Father God, we do thank you, Lord, for the preaching and teaching of your word. We thank you for your word to reveal to us, Lord, our status and standing with you. And God, that, you, that we can make sure that we've been born again and know that we're saved and understand, God, that you saved us to serve and you put us where you want us in the body of Christ and you have given us a position, you have given us a talent or a gift and you expect us to use it to the fullest until you come back because we will stand before your uh, judgment seat of Christ and give an account of our service to you and we can receive rewards or we can lose rewards and that will determine our position so help us God to understand this and know the seriousness of it and God bless everyone that's watching in this morning God I pray Lord that everyone is saved but probably someone looking in this morning has never saved received you as their savior never maybe ever been realized that they are lost but God I pray the Holy Spirit this morning I'll speak to their heart and help them to realize, hey, I'm not saved. I need to be saved this morning. And all I know now, all I got to do is just confess the Lord Jesus Christ with my mouth and believe it in my heart and I'll be saved. My name will be written in the Lamb's Book of Life and then I can start serving the Lord for the right reason, for the right purpose and be rewarded in the end. So God, just may your will be done in Holy Spirit. Do the work that only you can do. Convict hearts, save the lost, Reclaim the backslid and strengthen us Christians. Give us a deeper desire to be more faithful and obedient to our call and using our gifts and talents to have a desire to be our soul winners and to be a blessing to whomever we come in contact with and help us to let our light shine bright in this dark, perverse world. And God, you'll be honored and glorified and we will be blessed. And because of this, Lord, we can live a happy, victorious life no matter what's going on. And Lord, you only know what's going on and what we're going to face in the days to come. And folks, the only way we can survive, we got to be in the Lord Jesus Christ, strong in the faith and close to the, the throne of God in the cross and, and just ask for grace and strength to endure and persevere right to the bitter end. Contend for the faith so we can say at the end of life like Paul, I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. I have fought a good fight. And I pray this morning you're fighting a good fight and you'll continue to fight to the bitter end. 
take a stand for the Lord Jesus Christ, take a stand for the gospel, and be the Christian that we should be, and let that light on the hill shine bright. Lord, the world needs this, and they need to see a bright light that will show them the way. And Lord, let us be the light and the salt of this world. And God, we thank you and praise you for it. And now, Lord, as we close out here this morning, as we go over to the church for the morning worship service, God, we pray for our pastor, Pastor Jamie. God, just anoint him afresh today with the power of the Holy Spirit. Honor the word he studied. And God, help him, give him clarity of thought and expand upon your word and prepare our hearts and minds for it that we'll be blessed, we'll be encouraged, we'll be strengthened. And Lord, we just can be a better servants for you. And God, use that gospel message to reach the lost. God, may someone somewhere today be saved. And God, we'll give you all the praise, the honor, and the glory. And God, thank you for the privilege and honor of serving you in any way that we can. And Lord, as we close out, as we always say, Lord, hide us behind the cross. And let only Jesus be seen and heard. For since in his blessed, holy name we pray. Amen, amen. and amen. Amen. Had to get it in. Mercy.